Good morning. Welcome to Sunday morning worship, Creef Hall Church of Christ. We appreciate you being here this morning. I have a uh, quick announcement to make about Vacation Bible School. Yes, it is almost that time. And so we need you, your help. This is one of our largest outreach opportunities that this church has, and we want to continue that uh, this year. And uh, we have some special things lined up to make it more of an outreach opportunity. Um, first, you can see in the pews that the staff sign-up sheets are in your pews this year. Uh, so we, we would like for you to sign up uh, for anything that you see on that sheet that you're willing and able to do and then we will have boxes in the foyer where you can place those sheets uh, after you've signed up to help um, secondly this year we have a uh, kind of a separate uh, section for our youth and young people so anybody from sixth grade through twelfth grade we're going to have a kind of a youth rally a four-day youth rally uh, for them. They're going to have their own agenda, they're going to have their own uh, speakers and teachers, and we're going to make them their own postcards to give to their friends to invite them as well to that youth rally. We're asking all staff members to complete a form uh, uh, so, and to, so we can get a background check. Uh, those sheets uh, can be turned in to Mr. Tim McNutt Sr. either in his box or in person. Uh, or one of the elders and we'll get that taken care of. So we need to, to make sure we get that taken care of this year as well. Uh, we do have a lot of nice postcards made up for you to invite your friends and your family um, to this year's Vacation Bible School. We have some extra speakers coming in this year. We're gonna have a different speaker each night at Vacation Bible School for the adults and then on, uh, I believe it's Wednesday night, we'll have a breakout session for the women and for the men, uh, two different uh, classrooms there for a, for a special uh, uh, classroom uh, as well. So be looking for more details. We have a Facebook page dedicated to Vacation Bible School. So if you're on Facebook, make sure you check that out. We'll be sharing that through the main Creef Hall page as well. But be looking for that, as well as you can go to creephall.org slash VBS, and the announcements and signups and everything will be there as well. Um, our VBS team has been working very hard all the way since, uh, since Christmas, pretty much, uh, to, to make this one of the best that we've ever, ever had. So mark your calendars. This will be June 26th through June 29th. So coming up pretty soon. Thank you. This morning, all the announcements that need to be made are either in your pew paper or they have been on the screen already. And I don't want to take any time to make any other announcements this morning. Our emphasis today, more so than even most Sundays, is going to be on worship. We intend to not only talk about worship, but to worship in a way that's meaningful and that will help us leave this place closer to God and closer to one another. So that's what this is about. Things will be a little bit different order this morning, as you will notice. But let's begin with a prayer. Please bow with me. Our dear and Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day that you have given to us. We're so thankful for this opportunity to assemble together to worship you and sing praises unto you and study your word. So thankful for this time of worship. Father, we pray that we'll remember who we are and where we are. Pray that we'll be reverent uh, during this time. Father, we're so thankful for this congregation and the history of its standing firm. Father, we pray and so thankful for our elders. Pray that you be with them as they make the right decisions from time to time. Father, we're so thankful for 
our staff, We're so thankful for our, our ministers and the work that they do here. Father, pray that you be with uh, Bill in a few moments as he'll stand before us to uh, bring us a message from God's Word. Father, we're mindful of the many that are sick. Pray that I will be with them and pray that things will be done, will help them during this time. Father, we also are mindful of the many in our congregation that's lost loved ones over the last few days and weeks. Pray that you also be with them during this time. Pray that they will look to you for strength and comfort. Father, so thankful for the recent baptisms of many of our young people. We're so thankful for that, Lord, and pray that they will grow and in, in, in the church and, and be faithful to you. So thankful for them and their families. Father, we're so thankful for this great country that we live in. So thankful for the many blessings that you have given to our country. Father, we pray that you be with our leaders, our president, members of our Congress, be with our leaders in the state and local governments as well. Pray, Lord, that we'll be a nation that will turn wholly to you. Father, be with us as we continue in our worship today. Pray that all things we do will be well-pleasing to you. And forgive us of our sins, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. After these two songs, Elliot Moore will come and read our scripture, and then Bill will bring us our message. Let's stand for our first two songs, please. Be seated, please. (laughs) 
Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. All of us are always in danger of what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. Chronological snobbery is the arrogant notion that the ideas of our day are better than the ideas of days that went before because they're our ideas and they're in our day. It's, it feels like things are truer because they are newer. Now that whole idea is irrational and naive. It's irrational because it's arrogance to think that uh, being new is some kind of guarantee of being true. It's, it's arrogance on my part to think that a thought in my head is more true because it's in my head than the thought that was, say, in the head of John Smith because I live in the 21st century and it's my idea, and he lived in the 19th century and it was his idea. There's no logical connection between the truth of an insight and the century from which that insight came. I hope I'm making sense here. But it's also naive because there aren't any really new ideas under the sun, not the essential ideas. They've always been here. I want you to think about Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has already been in the ages before us. Everything that happens to us has already happened to somebody in one way or another, and I want us to flee from every temptation to be chronological snobs. I don't want us to be irrational or naive. C.S. Lewis, when he coined the phrase of chronological snobbery, he said there's one way at least to help avoid that, and that is that every third book you read ought to be a book from a different century. I think that's pretty good advice uh, to spend some time doing that. But with that in mind, I want to talk about Creve's Hall philosophy of ministry, who we are and what we do. We have a philosophy of ministry. We have some clear directives in that and distinctives in that ministry for us. And none of them, not one of them, I'm really happy to tell you, is new. Not one of them came up from our own ideas. We exist as a church to fulfill three priorities. One is to worship. Two is to nurture or edify. And three is evangelism. Every one of those respond, uh, corresponds to a relationship that we have to God and to our fellow believers and to the lost. Our responsibility, our directives, our purpose of being has to do with our relationships. Now, what I want to tell you is that we exist to reflect the grace of God back to him in worship. We exist to apply the grace of God to each other for edification in faith and in love, and we exist to show the grace of God to unbelievers in local evangelism and missions worldwide. That's what we do. That's the reason that we exist. That's the only reason that this church exists at all. So it seems to me that there's a way of measuring whether or not we're actually growing, whether or not we're actually fulfilling those areas of our priority, of what we're here for, of what God put us here for. And here's some questions I want you to ask yourself. We can ask it as a congregation, but congregations are made up of individuals, and so I'm asking you to ask yourself these questions. Number one, do you delight more and more in the majesty and glory of God? Is it just filling your heart more and more during your life? Does your heart incline to worship God more consistently, more intelligently, more earnestly, more intensely than it did five years ago? That's the first question about whether we're growing. The second question is this one. Is your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ abounding more and more so that you're using your talents more effectively 
to increase their faith and to stir them up to love and good works. Am I doing that more now than I was doing that five years ago? That's the second question. The third question I need to ask myself is, do I feel a burden for the lost? Do I have increasing prayers for my family and my neighbors and my relatives who are not children of God yet? Am I being more consistent in those prayers? Are my efforts to give a reason for the hope that's in me more bold and less ashamed than they were five years ago? Am I becoming a Christian with a worldwide view and a zeal for the lost people of all the world? Is that happening? Now, if my answer is yes to those things, I'm doing what God wants me to do. If my answer is no to those things, it means that I'm failing in those very concepts for which we exist. Now, here's my question. How are you doing? How are you doing when it comes to the three priorities of the church, when it comes to our worship, when it comes to the nurturing of our fellow Christians, when it comes to reaching the lost, how am I doing? At least when I see these three priorities, I know they're a goal and there's something for me to work for. At least I know that. But none of that's new. None of that is modern. None of that comes from Creve Hall itself. They've been around for 2,000 years. I remember one time I finished a sermon and one of the elders who didn't like what I had to say, and this is not here but in another place, he said, you've set this church back 20 years. And I said, I'm so sorry. I meant to set it back 2,000 years. I was, I was working, to, I, I just got short of where I wanted to be. These are the things that come all the way from Christ himself, that come from the church itself in its existence. They've been around all this time. They're tried and true. It shouldn't bother us at all that they aren't new. But I need to make a reminder this morning of these priorities because they're so easily forgotten. I need to be reminded of the three priorities of my life, the three priorities of the church, which is, again, worship, nurture, and evangelism. That's why we're here. That's what we're supposed to be doing. I want every regular attender of this congregation to be able to say to anybody who asks, why does Creve Hall exist? You need to tell them. This is why. This is why. I need to be aware that this is why. But today I want to focus on priority number one, the idea of worship. I want us to focus for a few moments on worship. Go back with me to verses 8 through 10 of Matthew chapter 4. You remember that Jesus is there. He's being tried in the wilderness, tempted by the devil, who has told him, bow down and worship me. Bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's the only real truth this morning that I want you to get out of that text. Jesus said, worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. What he's telling you is, what he's telling me is, what he was telling Satan is, that the priority, the, the priority or duty of every human being is to worship God. Now, if the Son of God counts it his duty to worship his Father, how about me? Let me illustrate that for just a moment. Uh, Suppose you're playing in the street in a kingdom, and you happen to be at this point in front of the king's palace. And as you're playing, the son of the king comes out, and he begins to play with you, and you're having a great time. And after a while, he says to you, I want you to come in and meet my father, the king. And you say, I can't. I've never been in the presence of a king. I'm not noble. We've been out here playing in the street. My clothes are dirty. They're not fit to stand in front of the king. I can't do it. And the king's son said, no, you're my friend, and he's my father, and it's okay. Come on with me. And he walks up to the doors of the palace and the guards open the door and you go through these splendid halls and you're, you're scared. You're going to meet the king and nothing in your life has ever prepared you for this. Your heart's beating so hard that you can see your shirt moving. You're thinking, what in the world am I going to do when I get in front of the king? 
But the king's son is happy and joking and laughing, and y'all are having a great time. And after a while, you're not quite as nervous as you were before. And then he comes to the great golden doors of the throne room. And when he grasps the handle of that door, his entire demeanor changes. Before, he was almost frivolous. You could see it in what he did. Everything there was just happy and and easygoing, and suddenly his face changes, and he becomes serious, not sad, not afraid, just serious, as though something really grave and important is getting ready to happen, and the change isn't artificial. It's not like an actor that was backstage joking with everybody and then he goes out, changes his face, and plays a sad scene. It's not that. This is real. The joking and the laughing and the fun were all real, and they were good. And the seriousness that he has when he grasps that door handle is also real and also good. It's like some mountain climbers who are in the car on their way to climb a mountain they've never climbed before, and they're laughing and they're talking and joking about about all the mountains they've climbed and the funny things that have happened and the danger that they've faced, and they're enjoying it, and suddenly the car rounds a curve, and they see the mountain they're about to climb, and there's absolute silence as they look in awe at that massive mountain. What was happening before with the laughing and the joking, it was real and good. And what's happening now in the odd silence is also real and good. And that's what was happening with the king's son. And he opens the door and he walks in and the king greets him. And the son falls on his hands and his knees and his face before the king. And here you are, a dirty peasant child who's never been in presence of a king before, Your mother has never told you what to do when you go to the presence of the king. No book that you've ever read tells you anything about what to do when you're in the presence of the king, but you know exactly what to do. You know exactly what to do because if the king's son got on his face before his father, you're going to do exactly the same thing. Well, that's what's going on right here in Matthew chapter 4. Here we are, the dirty, bedraggled, and sinful peasants who've been invited by the Son into the presence of the King. And what are we going to do? If the King's Son is worshiping, we're going to worship. If the King's Son is on his face before the Father whom he loves, the Father with whom he has this amazing relationship, I better get on my face before God. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. I love this text. Satan says, I'll give you everything if you'll bow down and worship me. And you would think that Jesus would say in response to that, Satan, I already own it. You don't. I'm the son of the great God. I am God himself. You bow down to me. That's what he could have said, and he would have been right. But it's not what he said. What he said was, my father said to worship him, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to worship him because he's the one who said it. And if Jesus said it, then I need to understand that worshiping God is the duty of every human being. That's what this passage is all about. But there's something more important even than that, and I want to share it with you for just a moment, something you may not have thought about before. That the number one priority of Creve Hall, there are three priorities, worship, nurture, and evangelism. Of those three, there is a most important priority. And that most important priority is worshiping God. The reason worship is number one is that Both the other priorities lead to this. What is nurture all about? That I encourage people to faith and love and growth so that they come into the presence of God and glorify His name. 
What's the purpose of evangelism? That I go to people who don't know God, share with them how great God is, how wonderful His Son is, so that they can come into the presence of God and worship Him. Both the other priorities serve this one priority, which is to worship God. Worship is the only one of our priorities that is an end in itself. So that when this life is over and evangelism is done, we will throughout all eternity be worshiping God. It is the one thing that is above all other things, worshiping God. It's why we've come here this morning. It's what God intends for us to be. Faith is valuable because it focuses on God and magnifies his self-sufficiency. You remember Romans chapter 4, verse 20, that Abram did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Strengthening in faith gives glory to God. That's the purpose of nurture. I think about Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. It all points to worship. Every bit of this points to worship. Nurture is not ultimate. It's crucial, but it's not number one. Evangelism is not ultimate. It's crucial, but it's not number one. So if I can revise a statement that I made earlier, let me say it like this. Worshiping God is not just the duty. Worshiping God is the number one duty of every human being. So I want to ask two questions about that. Number one, in what sense is it a duty? And number two, how shall we obey it? If it is a duty, how are we going to do it? So first of all, in what sense is it a duty? Well, let me illustrate that by a husband and wife who are talking to one another one day. And the, wife, and the husband says to the wife, must I kiss you? I want you to think about that. That he looks at his wife and he says, must I kiss you? And she answers by saying, yes, you must. But it's not that kind of must. What do you mean by that? What she means by that is this. That if you're kissing me, doesn't come from the spontaneous affection of a heart that loves me, it loses all its moral value to me. It has no value if you did it because you had to. It's a must, but it's not that kind of must. The heart has to be involved in all of this. It's, it, she's saying she doesn't want the kind of, kind of kiss that says, if I have to, okay, I will. And God doesn't want the kind of worship that says, okay, you told me to. I don't want to, but okay, I will because you said to. I want to tell you that won't do in kissing and that won't do in worship. And those two are really closely associated. They are. Worshiping is kissing toward God. That's what one of the statements of worship is. It means kissing toward God. Jesus showed the worthlessness of the worship of most of the people in his day as he quoted Isaiah in Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9. He said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Jesus is saying the doctrine must be right, but the heart must also be right. You and I have a duty to become a new person. We have a duty to become the person who loves to worship God. That's who we are. We have that must in our lives, the duty to feel the inwardness of affection. The psalmist David said it this way in Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. It's the duty of us to become a new person, to get a new heart, to worship from within to the outside. If we don't do that, then it doesn't really matter to God. It doesn't make a difference. So you need to listen to the Word of God. You need to pray that God will give you a new heart. And for some of you, it means that you need to repent from sin, confess His name before men, and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's His own command. God wants to make you into a person with a new heart who delights in the Lord. 
Well, if that's true, if that's the way our duty works, then how do we go about doing it right here? How do we go about doing it here publicly? How do we go about doing it privately? I want to make three general statements about how we do it, and then I'm just going to quit. Three general thoughts, and then we're going to worship. The first of those is that worship must be corporate, not just private. We should worship together and not just privately. Privately, yes, but not just privately. I want you to listen to Psalm 149, verse 1, where the psalmist said, Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the faithful. We are to praise God in the assembly of the faithful. What is that for us? The church. We are to praise God in the church. Now, you might say, I can worship God and feel closer to God if I'm by the lake or by the ocean or on the mountain or in the woods, and I feel much closer to God there. And maybe you can And I wouldn't for a moment take away your worship on those private moments that you have with God. But here's the thing. The test of whether any experience with God is genuine is that when I finish that experience with God, that I am more inclined to obey Him. If it's really an experience with God, then I want to obey Him. So here's my point. If you don't come away from your private worship with God at the lake or the ocean or the mountain or the woods or wherever it is that you have that private worship with God, if you don't come away from that with a greater desire to be with your brethren in worship, you have not had an encounter with God. You've had an emotional high, but you have not had an encounter with God. Because encounters with God make you want to be with God's people more. Not less, but more. It is a command to love, you know. If the deepest and highest and greatest joys in life, in worship, could be had privately, then the book of Revelation and its pictures of heaven would have a solo here and a solo there instead of the millions of people who are singing together. The one you've heard me so many times repeat is from Romans chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. For John said, I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. We should worship God together, not just in private. Here's a second general thought about worship, that it ought to be earnest. We worship God earnestly. Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, I would that you were cold or hot. But because you're neither cold nor hot but lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16. I don't think it's a stretch or a misuse of the text to say that lukewarm worship makes God want to vomit. I'm telling you, worship God earnestly. That's why Saturday night and early Sunday morning preparation are important for what we do right here. We're not naturally hot. We need to trim our wick with the Word of God and let the breath of God blow on us and renew that flame so that we burn brightly when we show up here on Sunday morning. We need to be less flippant less frivolous, less thoughtless, less casual, and less disrespectful as we approach the throne room of God in the assembly of the faithful. Have you thought about the implications of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13? God said, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Listen to that. Because he's making you a promise about what can happen right here. You will seek me and find me, God says, if you seek me with all your heart. There's only one reason that we come into this assembly primarily. There's side reasons, but the primary reason is to seek and to find God. That's the reason that we're here. 
and the Lord says to you every Sunday, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. So when you go to bed on Saturday night, do you say to God, I am seeking you with all my heart? When you get up on Sunday morning, you begin to think about and prepare for our worship together. Do you say with your preparation, with all my heart, I seek you? And when you get here in the assembly, does your posture and your demeanor and your attention and your, partici uh, your participation all say, Lord, I'm seeking you with all my heart? If not, you get no encouragement from Jeremiah 29, 13. Because you'll seek him and find him only when you seek him with all your heart. And if you're not doing that, you may have found the source of a hundred other problems in your life. Because when the soul doesn't earnestly feed on God, spiritual malnutrition shows up in every area of your life. And you begin to say, why is all this happening? Maybe because I've forgotten my number one priority, to seek him with all my heart. So seek him corporately, not just privately. Seek him earnestly. And in the third place, seek him expressively. Creve Hall has an order of service. You see it. If you're a visitor, you see it. We don't announce our songs before we sing them. We just sing them. They're up on the screen for you to sing, and there is a number up there if you want to find it in the book. But we do that. We pre-select our people who lead prayers. We have an orderly worship. We intend for it to be that way with the idea in mind of channeling everything toward people recognizing, honoring, glorifying, and praising God. That's what we want to do in this place. But you may get the idea, especially if you're a visitor, that there's not much spontaneity here that there's not much expressiveness here. If everything is this planned out, it's kind of dull and dead, but nothing could be further from the truth. I know that there are some expressions you could make that could be disruptive. I remember the time that I was preaching and a drunk came in the back and began to testify. It was a, it was a pretty good thing. I just uh, I nodded my head and let him talk until a big deacon tackled him, and it was okay. That was a little disruptive, okay? It, it was. But there are some things that you can do that are not disruptive at all. I love it. I love it. And I can tell you that the song leader loves it. And I can tell you that the person who leads the prayer loves it. And the person who presides at the Lord's table loves it when every once in a while they can look out and seeing you nod your head or say, mm -hmm, or amen, or something. Praise God. Something that's there. And I encourage you to do it. I encourage you to do it so that people who are here who don't know what we're doing will witness that we will magnify together the name and the truth of God. And I dream of the day when the truth of God and the spirit of worship are so deeply shared and so deeply valued by this family in this place that sometimes we will feel with one heart and one mind the need to be absolutely silent. And at other times, we will feel the need to shout out our praise. I'm looking forward to that. Both are valuable and both are real. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. There is a moment of awe where we all are silent. And then there are the moments like Psalm 96. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of all the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. So praise him. There are moments where you just don't hold it back and together we shout out our praise to God. These are the moments of our worship. And this is what our worship is about. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
you need to become a child of God this morning, this opportunity is yours. If you need to retune your heart back to God as his child, this opportunity is yours. Why don't you come while we stand and sing? Eat it, please. Can you go to that Come Let Us Worship at the bottom? Let's sing that. This is a youth song that we've been singing for many years, and I know we've sung it in here a couple of times, but it's fitting this morning as well. This morning, our brother Paul Nix comes forward. He's uh, part of the School of Preaching and uh, a member of the church. And he is asking for prayer. And I'm going to try my best to repeat how he expressed it, because I think it can apply to all of us. He's a faithful member, but sometimes he gets distracted. Has that ever happened to us? He also works with a lot of the members at his church, and he sees the problems in their lives. Has that ever happened to us? Yes. He's just asking for prayers, for strength, and for wisdom to be able to focus on God all the time in every moment of his life. Words for all of us. Let's pray. Dear Father, we're thankful for this moment we have now with Paul Nix. We're thankful for his good heart, for his faith, for his work in your kingdom. Father, please give him the wisdom he needs and the focus 
to constantly strive for you, to put you first in every aspect of his life, and to have the wisdom he needs in helping others that also need your help. And Father, these same words we echo for ourselves. We praise you and love you, our majestic and wonderful Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Let us now continue our worship by focusing on Jesus and the cross and this next part of our worship that he himself set up to help us remember him. On the last verse of this song, uh, we'll not only raise it a half step, but we'll also hold out the last syllable of the hallelujah. So kind of be watching me for that. If anyone here needs a kit, a cup to participate this morning, please raise your hand so one of the ushers can help you there. This is the part of our worship that we do weekly where we remember. 
Think about the things that we remember. Think about individually the things that we remember. We remember things that are important to us. We remember things that happen to our lives. We remember love and loss. We remember big moments, small moments. We take things that have emotional energy, things that sear themselves into our minds and into our hearts. And, uh, you know, we prioritize those things. This morning, we choose to remember Christ. We think about his example. He came to earth. We read the scripture. Our memories of him are based on believing the, the Bible, believing the New Testament, believing that his actions and his words and his deeds were driven by love, by believing and having faith in God, and believing that he was here for a mission, that he did things that were great things, big things, you know, raising people from the dead. He had quiet moments with people where he might have been one-on-one, -on -one, and again, all rooted in love. So this is the time that uh, we as Christians choose to remember him. This is Matthew 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to gather as your church, as your body, as your believers, and to remember your son, to remember Jesus and his great love for us and his sacrifice, to remember his last Passover with his disciples and the example that he set for us to remember that day. And as we take this bread, help us to remember that it symbolizes that each of us, as we have taken him on, in uh, repentance and confession and baptism as we have taken on his body, uh, as we take of this bread, help us to always remember that. In Christ's name, amen. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Shall we pray? Our Father, again, help us to sit here today and to Help our minds to focus on the fact that Jesus was both man and, and your son, and, and to help us to remember that he hung on a cross, physically hung, his body hung on a cross and died, and that they pierced his side and his blood ran down, and that he did that for us, that this was real, this happened, and to help us to remember as we take of this fruit of the vine that this represents that actual blood, blood that ran down for us that day, and help us to never forget this. In Christ's name, amen. Father.
separate and apart from the communion service, the elders have given us this opportunity to remember uh, the ways we've been blessed. And, and we are blessed that we're able to be here this morning. We may have been blessed in our lives financially with the means to help support the body here. And your contributions do support that. It supports what occurs in this building. It supports what occurs in many buildings around the world with mission efforts and things that many of us may not think about directly every day. So uh, as we're here this morning, we have the opportunity to give back. We also have the opportunity to do, do that online if that is more convenient. So let's have a prayer. Father in heaven, thank you again for the opportunity to give us life and breath and the ability to be here this morning. We thank you for the ways that you bless our life as well in, in giving us the means to support our families and to also be here and giving us the means to give back and help us in our hearts to be generous the way you have been generous with your son and uh, with what we have to look forward to. Help us to be generous in the same sort of way as we give back to the church. In, in your son's name we pray, amen. We'll sing this song and then one of our elders, Galen Northcutt, has an announcement and our closing prayer and then we'll sing a closing song after that. On behalf of the elders, I want to make this announcement to you. <clears throat> the elders want to inform you of some events which are going to enhance our work here at the Creve Hall Church of Christ. Our brother Phil Wagner has served us as our primary song leader for the last three plus years. During this time, he has gone on many mission efforts and Vacation Bible School works both here and abroad. Phil has presented the elders a program which puts him into the mission work, a work for which he has a great passion. His program will have him working with congregations both domestically and internationally. He would be directing the activities of various congregations' missions, efforts, and VBS activities. 
Phil would continue to work with our congregation in our VBS activities and our youth summer camps. He will also be working with some of the surrounding congregations in their similar efforts. Consequently, Phil will be traveling to be with many congregations during the year. If things go as he has planned, he will be absent many more weeks during the year than he is currently doing extensive mission work. With Phil being frequently absent, we're going to bring on Brother Jonathan Beard to be our full-time song leader. He, his wife Kathleen, and son Walter will start worshiping with us the first week in May, and they are sitting back here in our audience. Phil and Jonathan will begin a soft transition beginning the first week in June through the end of July, at which time Jonathan will become the full-time song leader at Creve Hall. We thank Phil for his efforts in leading us in our singing for the last three years plus. Jonathan brings with him eight years of full-time song leading service and experience from the Forest Hill Congregation in Germantown, Tennessee and at Mount Olive Congregation in Vernon, Alabama, and the Gwen Congregation in Church of Christ in Gwen, Alabama. He has a total of 21 years of song leading, and he served as the deacon of worship at the Forest Hills Congregation. So when you see these men, congratulate them on the, and encourage them on the endeavors in which they're about to enter. Would you bow with me, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be here today, that we've had to worship you. And Father, we trust that we have done so enthusiastically and in spirit and in truth. And Father, we ask your blessings on this congregation and particularly on Phil and on Jonathan as they enter new works here in this congregation. We ask that you be with the leaders of our country and the worldwide that peace may reign rather than war. We ask that you watch over us, Father. Please forgive us when we fail you. But most of all, give us a home with the above. It's our prayer in Christ's name, and amen. We'll sing this final song and give our teachers a chance to get to their classes. If you would, let's stand for this final song, please. Let's go to our classes.